everyone, and welcome to Kansas City Public Library Central Library. I'm Katie Stover, Director of Reader Services. I'm hoping many of you have had a chance to view Invited to Life, Finding Hope After the Holocaust. This is a series of stunning photographs in our Goldner Gallery on the first floor. These photos were taken by photojournalist B.A. Van Size. And tonight's event is one of two celebrating this exhibit. The second will take place next Wednesday, same time, same place. We're making it easy for you. You will have the opportunity to meet the artist, B.A. Van Size, and one of the subjects of his portraits, Alan J. Hall. I really hope to see you here. I also hope to see many of you at the library's first annual Heartland Book Festival. It starts Friday, October 6th, with a keynote featuring Jermaine Fowler. Saturday, October 7th, will highlight award-winning thriller novelist Karen Slaughter. And you can learn more at heartlandbookfest.org or look for bookmarks on the signing table out in the lobby. Books are available in the lobby, and our guests will be signing right after the presentation. I'd like to encourage anyone watching the live stream to purchase a copy of The Last Million from bookshop.org or your favorite local independent bookstore. And as a final reminder, please take a moment to silence any cell phones or mobile devices. The library is delighted to continue a strong relationship with the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, celebrating their 30th birthday this year. And we are appreciative that they have brought in tonight's guest, David Nassau. Jessica Rockhold, Executive Director for the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education, is here to introduce our esteemed guest. Jessica? Good evening, everybody. We're so pleased that you're here with us, and we are thrilled to be back at the Kansas City Public Library. As Katie mentioned, this is a long-standing partnership and one that we deeply value, so we're just thrilled to be back here. Uh, I'd also like to thank the donors to the Jean G. Zeldin Partners in Holocaust Education Fund at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. It's because of their generosity that we were able to bring Dr. Nassau here this evening. So thank you to <clears throat> Jean and the donors. This exhibit spoke to us at the Midwest Center for Holocaust Education. We have a portrait exhibit of our local survivors that has many similar characteristics. It's about the survivors and who they are after the war. And what we know and we try to teach around is that um, their experience of the Holocaust does not end with their liberation, that it's something they carry with them throughout their lives. And it is sometimes easy for us as learners to think about them in their Holocaust world, and then maybe to think about them as these adults that we know, but miss that middle piece. And so this book, The Last Million, is something that we've had our eye on and it came out during COVID, but it's a story that resonated with us. It's something that we wanted to bring to this community because it speaks to this very complex moment after the war when Europe is in chaos and people are trying to find their new homes. And so um, we are so pleased to have come out of that period and now be in a space where we can bring Dr. David Nassau to Kansas City to speak to all of you. He has a remarkable resume. He is um, a uh, distinguished professor emeritus of history, biography and memoir, and American studies at the City University of New York. He's a past president of the Society of American Historians. He has several books that would interest all of you. Um, he has written about uh, William Randolph Hearst, Andrew, Andrew Carnegie, um, Joseph Kennedy, uh, and multiple prizes, including the Bancroft Prize and being a two-time Pulitzer Prize finalist for his works. So he's an impressive historian, but I have to say that what I find most valuable about his work is how accessible it is. And um, I think you're really going to gain from tonight's presentation, and it's my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Nassau. Thank you. Delighted to be here. Let me turn on my clicker. There we go. Uh, 
I'm going to tell a story tonight. I used to talk about it as a forgotten chapter in the history of the Holocaust, the history of Israel, the history of World War II, U.S. history. But it's not so much forgotten as never told. Forgotten means it was once told and then forgotten. As an American historian, as a Jew, as someone who has paid attention to the Holocaust and to Jewish history, I believed, like so many others, that when the war was over, the sun came out, the camps were opened, the survivors walked out into the fresh, free air, and the American people and the American government welcomed them with money, with homes, with love. I learned only later that that was wrong, very wrong. That the truth was that for three to five years after their liberation, the survivors lived no longer in concentration camps, but in displaced persons camps behind barbed wire. If you go downstairs and look at the exhibit, those few people who talk about when they came to the United States, talk about coming in 48, 49, 50. And it took me a while to realize that the Holocaust survivors that I had met as a child and as an adult, when I asked them, when did you come to the United States, they would say, well, 48, 49, 50. Uh, and it didn't register. It didn't register. So my book, The Last Million, is about the last million refugees who, when the war was over, were caught in Germany. Some of them were Jews. Some of them were Polish Catholics. There were Lithuanians, Latvians, Estonians, Yugoslavs. There were Eastern Europeans who, for one reason or another, either could not go home because they had no homes to return to like the Jews, or did not want to go home because their homes for the Poles and the Latvians and the Lithuanians had been destroyed, and the freedom of their nations had been taken away, and they were now ruled by the Soviets. And they did not know what to expect. At the end of World War II, Europe was destroyed, disrupted, devastated. The cities of Germany, the cities of England, the cities of Eastern Europe had been leveled to the grounds. There was starvation. There was disease. There was lawlessness. And there were several million refugees left behind in Germany, a lesser number in Austria and in Italy. They were housed in makeshift displaced persons camps in old army barracks, hotels, resorts, monasteries, and sometimes cordoned off towns. The camps were administered by UNRWA, the United Nations Relief and Rehabilitation Agency Authority, which was put together by Franklin Roosevelt to care for the refugees before there was the United Nations. The camps were protected by the armies of occupation, and the people in them were fed mostly by American dollars 
and protected by American soldiers. Before entering, let me try again here. Oh, we're going to, to the rescue. There we go, OK. This is a group of refugees, when they came out of the camps, those who were able to stand and who were being transported from the concentration camps or having freed themselves from the concentration camps, homeless, wandering through the streets of Germany, begging for food, looking for nourishment, looking for settlement. They were rounded up by the American and the British armies, and they were brought into the displaced persons camps. But first, they were disinfected. They were treated like animals. And it made sense, because they had been treated like animals and caught the diseases of animals while in the camps. Who were the last million, and why were they in Germany? Well, large numbers of them were Polish and Ukrainian forced laborers. The Germans, one of the crimes of the Nazi regime was the kidnapping of millions of Poles and Ukrainians and Eastern Europeans who were forcibly brought into Germany to do the work that the soldiers who were now fighting the war had once done, to bring in the crops, to work in the factories, to run the trains. This is a group of Polish refugees. They were forced laborers, kidnapped and brought into Germany to work. But as you can see, they are not terribly unhealthy. They did not go through what the Jews went through. Here they're lining up to sign in. They don't want to go home. They can't go home. There's no way to get back to Poland and they are registering for the displaced persons camps. These are American or British soldiers. I can't tell from the cap. This is a group of Polish displaced persons in an assembly center in July 1945 waiting assignment. The largest group of displaced persons, 500,000, 600,000, were Polish refugees. This is a young Polish displaced person showing her Nazi tattoo on the way into a displaced person's camp. It's hard to know what the reaction is among the other Polish displaced persons. The second large group were the Lithuanians, the Latvians, and the Estonians. And how did they get into Germany? Why did they get into Germany? Because large numbers had collaborated with the Nazis. The Nazis thought that Latvians and Lithuanians and Estonians were closer to being Aryans. They were not Aryans, but they were closer. Therefore, they didn't have to be subjected to the same kinds of authoritarian rule as the Poles. They were allowed some degree of self-government. And lots of Latvians and Lithuanians cooperated, collaborated with the Nazis in the murder of the Jews and in running a Nazi Latvia, a Nazi Lithuania, a Nazi Estonia. And as the war came to an end, as the Red Army begins to push into Latvia and Lithuania and Estonia, these collaborators knew that they had to get out. They had to get out. 
and with the help of the German army, they made their way in long lines from Latvia, Lithuania, into Germany. This is from October 1944, when the Red Army is already pushing in. Okay. And then there were the Jewish survivors. When the war is over, the German high command comes to the conclusion that rather than gas Jews in concentration camps, why not work them to death in Germany? Why not bring them from the camps in Poland and in the Baltic nations into Germany and put them to work in the underground factories, in the mines, to create the super weapons that Hitler thought was going to win the war in the end. And the conditions underground, they, why were they underground? So they couldn't be bombed, these factories. The conditions there were such that they wouldn't put Germans to work in there. They wouldn't even put Poles. They put French prisoners of wars, and they put Jews. And hundreds of thousands, the, the last survivors of the camps, those who were alive and could walk, walked or were put on in, back in boxcars and brought into Germany to work, to be worked to death. When the war was over, when the war was over, they were liberated by American soldiers, and by British soldiers, and by Russian soldiers. In Germany, it was the Americans and the British. And the survivors in Bergen-Belsen, one of the more notorious of the camps, were moved from the concentration camp to the officers' quarters, a luxurious resort about a mile away from the camp. And the British burned down Bergen-Belsen. This is May of 1945. They burned it to the ground. Why did they burn it to the ground? Because they were convinced that the diseases, that the typhus, the typhoid would spread, um, and that the only thing to do was to burn it to the ground. When I did my book, I, I did a lot of, I'm a crazy researcher. Um, it's one of my, you know, Drives my family nuts, drives me nuts, but I, I can't quite stop. Um, I read and listened to radio broadcasts and looked at newsreels about the liberation of the camps. And I discovered something that came as another surprise to me. Nobody talked about the Jews. The famous broadcast of Edward R. Murrow from London, the newsreels, the newspapers. They go into Dachau and they talk about the liberation of Dachau, Bergen, Belsen, Ordruf, Buchenwald. But there's no mention of Jews. It's as if the Jews didn't exist. Why? Because they were so diseased, so bedraggled, so starved. They were, how can one put it? They were on the edge of descending from humanity into, into something else. And they spoke Yiddish. Edward O. Murrow didn't speak Yiddish. 
nor did anybody who came with him. Um, the newspaper reports in Edward O. Murrow talked about the French prisoners of war and the British prisoners of war and the Czech flyers who were there, but nothing about the Jews. How did Americans learn? Amer Americans thought, well, maybe all the Jews have been killed. Attached to every army unit was a Catholic chaplain and a Protestant chaplain and a Jewish chaplain. And the Jewish chaplains who were supposed to be looking after the Jewish soldiers said to hell with that, the war's over, we won. And the Jewish chaplains, one after another, deserted effectively. They kept their uniforms on. Some of them borrowed Jeeps and they went into the camps. And what they saw frightened and astounded them. And they wrote back to their congregations, to their temples, to their synagogues. They wrote letters to their local newspapers. They wrote letters to their congressmen, their politicians. And they said, something has to be done. Something has to be done for the Jews. It's not enough to just throw them into displaced persons camps. They need more help than the Poles or the Lithuanians. Please. And the word came sort of filtering down. Again, not from the radio broadcasters or the newsreels or the newspapers, from, from the Jewish chaplains. And it comes filtering down until it gets to Washington. Who is the one member? It's a quiz. You don't have to. You know, who's the one Jewish cabinet member under? Morgenthau. 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 OK. Morgenthau, who had not been a religious, never was not a religious Jew in any way, um, was a farmer from upstate New York, a neighbor of Roosevelt. The word gets to him. And, and he's astounded. He doesn't know what to do. So he, he goes to the Secretary of State, and he tries to get in touch with, by this time it's Truman, to say, we've got to do something about the Jews. And they eventually decide they're going to send a man named Earl Harrison, who was an Episcopalian who had become a Quaker. Um, and he knew something about immigration. He had no record of any sort uh, as a supporter of Jewish causes. And Truman decides to send him to investigate whether these rumors are true. And Harrison, with a member of the Joint Distribution Committee, a very important Jewish committee, they, they go, and the army sets out an agenda for them. You'll visit here, you visit here, you talk to this one. They rip it up. And they go to all the displaced persons camps, and they talk to the survivors. They talk to the survivors. And Harrison writes a blistering memo to Truman and the State Department. And Truman, thank God, for some reason, he's just gotten back from Yalta. And, and he knows that this Harrison wants to present his report. Generally, you know, a report is presented, and Truman hands it off to someone. Presidents don't read these reports. But for some reason, Truman decided he was going to meet Harrison, and he was going to take this report. He was going to take it in, delivered by Harrison. And he went home and he read it that night. And he was horrified. In the report, Harrison said, we are doing, we are treating the Jews, the Jewish survivors, the way the Germans did, except we're not exterminating them. We're just slowly starving them to death. And something has to be done. The British have to open up. Palestine to Jewish immigration. And we have to get at least 100,000 Jews out of the displaced persons camps at once. 
And Truman does two things. Truman immediately writes Eisenhower, and he says to Eisenhower, you've got to do something. You've got to do something. And Eisenhower, let me go back one. Eisenhower says, you know, I'm sorry. He makes excuses. And then Eisenhower does the right thing. He orders his troops to move the Jewish survivors into their own camps. Previously, previously, everybody had been divided by nationality. So if you would come from Poland, or you would come from Latvia, or you would come to Lithuania, whether you were a Jew or whether you were a Latvian policeman who had persecuted the Jews, you were in the same camp together. The Jews were in the minority, and the Jews were in no position to exert any kind of authority. So Eisenhower makes sure that the Jews get their own camps. There's a woman getting help. There's a, some of the journalists wrote about baby carriages. That all over Germany, there were baby carriages that were being used to transport luggage. Um, wheelchairs used to transport luggage and the belongings of the, whatever the Jews had brought with them. And then Eisenhower does something absolutely extraordinary. He goes on a tour of the Jewish displaced persons camps, and he celebrates the high holidays. Patton goes with him. And Patton is, you know, if you, can, if, if you buy my book, you can skip over this, because it, is, it will turn your stomach what Patton has to say about the Jews who live in the displaced persons camps. Um, from that moment on, Patton is on his way out because Eisenhower cannot abide it. So Eisenhower goes into the, the synagogue to, um, for the high holy days. Um, an extraordinary moment. Truman implores Churchill. And after Churchill, Clement Attlee, to open up Palestine, to let 100,000 displaced persons into Palestine. And Attlee says no. And his foreign minister, Bevan, says no. You know, lots of people were damaged and hurt and displaced during World War II. Why are we going to put the Jews at the front of the line? And again, I've got letters, communiques, diplomatic dispatches that I quote in my book, in which the top British authorities say that. What's the big deal with the Jews? You know, they're whining. Um, and Truman begs and does everything he can. And there is the beginning of a movement to get, to push Britain, this is in New York, to push Britain to open the gates of Palestine to Jewish immigration. Meanwhile, the Jews are in their own camps. I mean, look what they have gone through, these people. But they can't afford to mourn. They can't afford to feel sorry for themselves. They know that six million have been killed. And the survivors have a responsibility to make sure that Hitler does not win. And in order to make sure that Hitler does not win, the Jewish community the survivors have to rebuild as best they can a Jewish community. And they do it. They do it. 
they set up schools, hold cultural events, dances, concerts. They, you know, as Jews do, there are, you know, if there are 100 Jews, there are um, 20 synagogues for them. Um, and they begin slowly to rebuild a life. Now, only a minority of the Jewish survivors go directly into the displaced persons camps. Where do most of them go? When they get out of Bergen-Belsen, when they get out of Dachau, when they get out of Buchenwald, they go home looking for survivors. Is any or any family members left? You know, is my home left? Is my farm left? Is my business left? Is my shop left? And it is not only the survivors from the camps, but Polish Jewry is saved by crossing the border into the Soviet Union, living a miserable life in Stalin's Soviet Union, but staying alive. And when the war is over, Stalin, for whatever reasons, and because it's hard to get into the Soviet ar Russian archives, nobody knows what those reasons are, he, when the war is over, he moves trains up in the northern, eastern, regions of the Soviet Union to bring the Polish Jews back to Poland. 200,000, 250,000 Polish Jews come back. They're the survivors with those who lived through the concentration camp system and with those who stayed in hiding in Poland or joined the partisans in Poland. And what do they find in Poland? They find anti-Semitism worse than it had ever been. They find pogroms. They find hatred. Time after time, they will go home to their apartments or their houses, and they are greeted with, we thought you were dead. You don't live here anymore. And then the pogroms in Poland reach a I don't know what, how to say it. They, they reached their height in Kilchup, where there is a pogrom in which a number of displaced Jews are murdered. Kilcha. July 1946. A survivor mourning the death of a relative. And in July 1946, a year after the war, the Poles who had come home from the Soviet Union, the Poles who had been in hiding and tried to, you know, cre recreate a Jewish community, um, they begin to leave Poland. And this is one of the ironies of, of Jewish history and of European history. There is one place where the Jews of Europe, the Polish Jews, feel safe. And that's Germany, behind barbed wire in the displaced persons camps where they're protected by American soldiers. And they begin the journey through Austria. They cross borders. The American soldiers are supposed to keep them out. The American soldiers say, the hell with that. The American soldiers help them as they move. These are, you, you can see these are healthier looking people. They, they had survived in the Soviet Union. And there were young people. There are no people in their 20s and 30s who, you know, the, the camps were old people and, and young people survived here or Jews on their way into Germany in a makeshift assembly center. 
in Salzburg, Austria. And when the Jews, the Polish Jews arrive, the camps, the, the Jewish population of the displaced persons goes from 50, 60,000 to a quarter million. And by the middle of 1946, there are a quarter million Jews in the displaced persons camps. And again, again, there is no room, there is no time for mourning. Those who had been lost, everyone in the camps has someone who's been lost. They have to rebuild their communities. The highest birth rate in the world following World War II is in the displaced persons camps. Okay. There are more baby carriages with babies in them in the displaced persons camps than anywhere in Europe. And the Jews, they, they don't want to stay in the displaced persons camps forever. Large numbers of them want to go to Palestine. But in the meantime, they've got to rebuild themselves. This is a boxing match. All the different camps have chess tournaments. They have boxing, sporting events. There's a boxing match in the Neu Freiman displaced persons camp in 1948. Can anybody tell who that is? This is, huh? This is Bernstein. Bernstein comes to Germany and he leads in the camps. Think of this. In the camps, they have orchestras. They put together orchestras with borrowed instruments and Bernstein comes to two camps, Feldafing and Landsberg, and he leads, he brings with him musicians from the Munich Philharmonic, okay, and survivors to play concerts. Ben Gurion comes, and Ben Gurion comes to a, a camp and he says, We will not abandon you, the Jewish community. We will do everything we can to get you to Israel. And in a number of the camps, the young people, the young survivors, prepare. They prepare by learning how to farm to go to Palestine. I'm going to sort of jump here to the end. It's hard to talk about a 400-page book and years and years of research in 45 minutes. Um, so I've, I've jumped. By, by 1947, 1948, the world realizes that they've got to close down these displaced persons camps. And there's a virtual bazaar. Every nation, Canada, Brazil, South Africa, they send representatives to the camps to choose people who are going to go to those countries and fill in the labor shortage from World War II. Everybody wants the Latvians. They're supposed to be, you know, they're strong, the displaced persons. They should have been strong. They didn't have to go through what the Jews and the Poles went through. Um, and second to the Latvians and the Lithuanians and the Ukrainians and the Poles. Nobody wants the Jews. So what do the Jews do? What do the Jews do? Do they sit back? Do they wait for you know, the Americans or the Canadians or the Brazilians to say, come on? No. They begin what is referred to as Aliabet, the illegal immigration. Some of the fortunate ones learn skills that they hope are going to get them homes somewhere in the new world. This is a group, a sewing workshop. Canada has said it will accept, I don't know what the number is, it's in my book, 2,000, I think, Jewish tailors. Um, 
So in every one of the camps, there are training groups. Um, someone's grandfather is in this picture, wrote me a letter when they read my book. Um, but most people don't want to go to Canada. They want to go to Palestine, a large number of the Jews. And here's two, two Jewish DPs who had to, you know, cross the borders, come to Marseille, where a boat, which was later renamed the Exodus, was going to take them to Palestine illegally. Illegally. Um, the Americans eventually pass a Displaced Persons Act in June of 1948. It takes the American Congress three years after the war is over. And they begin to accept people out of the displaced persons camps. But a coalition of Midwestern Republicans and Southern Democrats writes into the legislation a provision which says that the only people who can get these special visas, there are going to be 200,000 of them, are those who had been in the camps in May of 1945. 90% of the Jews were not in the camps then. They were in the Soviet Union. They were in hiding. They had gone home from the concentration camps. So 90%, the first law that's passed inviting displaced persons leaves out 90% of the Jews. And who comes instead? Who comes instead? It's not a pretty picture. America welcomes its new citizens. Um, it's is misspelled, as you can all see. <laughs> but on that group, there are no Jews. This is Karl Linus. He's accused in a Soviet show trial in 1962, and he was guilty of atrocities at Tartu, a concentration camp in Estonia. He moved to Green Lawn, Long Island. And he was not discovered and deported until 1987. Do the math. Bishop Trifa, the leader of the Romanian Iron Guard, goes to Grass Lake, Michigan, becomes a bishop. No one quite knew how that happened. He knows what's happening. And in 1982, he leaves. For Portugal. This is the last. This is a Ukrainian camp guard. It took 16 years to deport this guy after it was discovered that he had been a guard in a concentration camp. In 2018, he's deported. Again, do the math. How long was he in the United States living a good life? I just want to end not leaving you the portraits of these people. I want you to leave with another image, another memory. Um, in doing my research, I met with Itzik and Lola Lachman in a nursing home in Little Neck, Long Island. Itzik had lost every member of his family. Lola had survived. And Itzik survived because he was, a, he was useful to the Nazis as a carpenter, as a locksmith, as a jack of all trades. He was a, a little man with amazing skills. Lola survived because she was a strong young woman. And 
she got to Dachau, where her twin sister died of typhus. Lola and Itzik had met when they were 15 years old in Poland. They hadn't said a word to one another, but Itzik swears that he saw Lola at this lakeside resort where Jews went. And they find each other again at Dachau. And they move together. They don't recognize each other at Dachau. Um, they end up at Feldafing. And Itzik goes to the American in charge of the camp. And, and he says, I've, I've got to do something useful. He says, I, I've worked for Nazis. He said, I've got to do something for my own people. Please, please, please. And they say, well, we need bunk beds put together in the girls' dormitories, the women's dormitories. And he walks into the women's dormitory, and he sees Lola. They fall in love. They're married. They have two children. And finally, in 1949, after the law keeping the Jews out, is amended, they come to the United States with the help of a cousin. And how does the cousin know about them? We're going to go back to the beginning of my talk, the Jewish chaplain. The Jewish chaplain comes through Feldafing, and he interviews everybody. And he says, do you know anybody in the United States? And Itzik says, I think I have a cousin in, uh, I, I don't, in Brooklyn or New Jersey or Newark. Brooklyn or Hoboken, Brooklyn. So the chaplain writes everything down, and he sends a notice to the forwards and all the Yiddish newspapers, the Jewish newspapers. And the cousin reads it and gets in touch with the chaplain. They confirm the relationship. He sponsors Itzik and Lola. They come to the United States. And the rest of the story is just remarkable. When I met them, they were in a nursing home. They had celebrated their 60th wedding anniversary. The only problem they had was that Lola had had a stroke, and she had no short-term memory. And Itzik would ask her a question. You know, what do we have for lunch? And she wouldn't answer, and Itzik would get mad. But there was a nurse there on duty, and whenever they heard Itzik's voice rise, they ran in and they explained to Itzik that Lola wasn't being nasty. She just didn't remember. They were wheeled into the visitor's room so I could interview them. And Lola sat there silently. And Itzik, with tears in his eyes, told me the story. And then at the end, he looked at me, and he said, it's a wonderful life. Mm. I have a wonderful wife. I have children. I have grandchildren. It's been a wonderful life. I thank you, and. I'm happy to take questions. There are mics. Please. Thank you. Thank you. Please come up to the mic if you have a question. Yes, sir. Is it on? I, I don't think it's on. OK, the, I, I have two questions. The first is the Roma experience. So apparently, many of the Roma were also exterminated, and I'm wondering if they ended up in displaced persons camps. And the second question is about the role of Italy and the rat lines. Apparently, there was a lot of people leaving Germany through Italy. Uh, Nazis were headed to South America, and apparently a lot of Jewish were headed for Palestine. So I, I'm wondering if there were different networks or similar networks that were working throughout Italy to, to move people on. Yeah. The Roma did not. The the Roma did not come to the United States. Um, they 
some, a small number, came into the camps and then left the camps as soon as they could to go back to their homes. Large numbers didn't get into the camps because they had been exterminated. The Rat Lines are, is a true story. There are any number of books, the most disturbing of which, there's a book by a man named Sands, um, who was a um, British lawyer whose family um, was exterminated. And then there are books by a man named David Kurtzer. And the David Kurtzer books are the most disturbing because they tie the Vatican and the Pope directly to the rat lines. And yesterday there was an article in the paper, I don't know if anybody saw it, about a letter that now was, was found in which a German Catholic writes to the Vatican and says directly, the Jews are being exterminated. This is in 1942, and it had to have gotten to the Pope. It was a priest. It, it was, was a priest, yeah, a priest. It was, the letter was sent to the Pope's it personal, sent personal secretary. personal secretary, yeah. yeah. And there's no way that the Pope didn't see this. Exactly. Yes, sir. Yeah, in May 48, when Israel became a nation, how did Israel, the government of Israel, handle immigration after they became a nation? What did they, what did they do? There was a great debate in Israel. Israel was in the midst of a war, and the last thing some of the members of the cabinet said Israel needed was European Jews who had gone through the Holocaust and couldn't help in the war effort. Ben Gurion and Golda Meir said, the hell with you. It is our responsibility to take everybody. And the new state of Israel raised money for tuberculosis sanitaria, for hospitals, and anybody who wanted to go went. Of the 200,000 200, people I could check who came, Jews who came out of the displaced persons camps, about 50,000 came to the United States eventually. More than 200,000 went to Israel. And why did they go to Israel? Some because they were Zionists, other because there was no place else on earth that was going to welcome them. And many of those went, many of those went reluctantly to Israel. Why? Because they had been through one war and they didn't want to go through another one. But there was no place else that was welcoming them. Yes, sir. So I have a question about the liberation of the camps. And maybe this is... American propaganda, but I thought that it was the Soviets that liberated the first camps. Yes. What role did they play? You mentioned yeah. the Americans, you mentioned the British. What, what role did the Soviets play? The Soviets liberated Auschwitz. Um, the Soviets liberated the camps that were in eastern Poland, especially Auschwitz, uh, Auschwitz-Birkenau. Um, and they talked only about, they didn't talk about the Jews, they talked about the atrocities in much the same way that the American army did. While the war was going on, Eisenhower and the Soviets wanted to convince the soldiers, the American soldiers, this is what we're fighting for and we've got to fight this war to the end. Not to save the Jews, you know, but to defeat the Nazis, okay? And that was pretty much the, the, Soviet, the Soviet line. So in, in the period of time, just either leading up to World War II and the early phases, the U.S. State Department was uh, uh, fairly adamant in keeping Jewish refugees out of the United States. Um, uh, in fact, my, my aunt, mother's aunt was on um, the Hamburg, uh, the, the ship that uh, got turned back and ended up, and, they, and she ended up perishing. To, to what extent did 
did that State Department policy continue after the war in this period of time that you're referring to? Yeah. And maybe you could talk a little bit about, it seems like a disconnect between here Truman is the President of the United States, the State Department theoretically is, is, is subject to his point of view, and yet it seems that they were not, in fact, doing so. You, you got it. <laughs> I mean, um, did you read my book? Because I say exactly that. Uh, Truman, Truman had nothing to do with the State Department. The State Department were elitist Ivy Leaguers, uh, no Catholics, no Jews. Um, they supported the British when the British didn't want to open up Palestine. Um, Truman had nothing to do with them. Truman, in his private letters, talked about these, you know, these idiots um, in their, you know, in their suits and stiff, well-creased pants. Um, Truman overrode on any number of occasions the State Department. Right away, within week, within days of Truman becoming president, the State Department visited him. And the State Department said, Breckenridge Long was this vicious anti-Semite who ran the immigration division of the uh, State Department. And the State Department sent a representative, a high representative to Truman, and said, look, we just want you to know that the Jews are going to exercise a lot of pressure um, on you to do something. Um, you know, just ignore them. Ignore them. And Truman, that same day, met with Rabbi Weiss from New York, you know, as, as a way of saying to the State Department, you know, mind your own business, I'm president, I don't listen to you. <laughs> the problem was that, that Truman didn't take that final step. He could have. If Truman had said to the Brits, the Brits needed an American loan when the war was over, and if Truman had said to the British, no money until you open Palestine, the British would have had no choice. But, but he didn't take that step. Somehow Truman thought that if he pressured and pushed and you know, the British would give in, um, but they didn't for two reasons. One is anti-Semitism. Two is that they were going to appease the Arabs because the Arabs had the oil. Um, and Truman believed that the power of pers persuasion uh, would be enough. It wasn't. So a question about the creation of the State of Israel and why it was one of the few things that the U.S. and the Soviets were both behind. So it, it seems really weird because the Cold War is starting right then, but Israel's is getting its weapons from the Czech Republic or Czechoslovakia. Yeah. And apparently the Moscow was supportive. Of yeah, Moscow was supportive. And one of the reasons why, one of the reasons why Truman recognizes the state of Israel within minutes of the Declaration of Independence was he doesn't want the Soviets to do it first. That's number one. <laughs> number two, Truman realizes, Truman realizes that he's got to get a quarter million Jews, 200,000 Jews out of Germany. He can't have an independent Germany. He wants West Germany to be a part of NATO to help fight the Cold War. He can't do that when there were 200,000 Jews in displaced persons camps. He's got to get them out of there. He can't get them into the United States. He can't get them in anywhere else. So he becomes a fervent supporter of Israel. Some of his advisors say it's because of Jacobson, his Jewish friend, yeah, a little bit. But mostly because he's got to get the Jews out of Germany. He can't ask American taxpayers to keep them there. He can't say, OK, Germany, you're free and independent. And by the way, take care of the 200,000 Jews in camps. <laughs> we have time for these last two questions. 
And then we want to ask David to step outside the lobby and sign books. Thank, Thank you. you. I've always wondered why, for all that Truman diplomatically supported Israel and the Jewish people, I understand that he kept the arms embargo. He sold no weapons to Israel, nor did Eisenhower after him. It was maybe Kennedy. It was much later that we started. The Israelis were flying mirages. They never had as American weapons until much later. So can you help me understand why he didn't militarily help them, or at least with materiel? Yeah, um, it's a great question. I think he could go as far as, he went as far as he could. That was a step he was not willing to take, number one. And number two, the best information he had, and, and historians are beginning to look at this now and, and reevaluate it, was that the Arab League never had a chance against Israel. That in 48, uh, the Arab armies were badly led, badly equipped, um, and the Israeli army um, knew what it was doing. Um, there, it was a dreadful war, it was a difficult war, but in the beginning, at least in 48, I think the, the word that Truman had was, the Israelis are taking care of this, and Truman didn't stop the illegal shipments. There was a lot of illegal arms that were not sanctioned. The that, the absolutely. And it ran right. You know, I have, I have friends who raised money, you know, raised money. That money went to arms, and it got into Israel. Uh, Truman knew, and he, he let it go. Yes, ma'am. In um, when you're in offense, when you're in the offense position, when you're trying to defend yourself, there's always trauma and stress after the fact. And <clears throat> in both parties, because once you start learning that you have to defend yourself, you have to also protect yourself after the fact because you have trauma, they call it PTSD. So I'm a woman and I had PTSD, but I learned to write a play-by-play -play of two experiences that I had of trauma. And when I wrote that out in word for word, like one, two, three, four, five, six, I learned about the person who had offended me. And I had no clue you know, before that fact, what, why he was offensive. And I think that's a good policy to give, you know, in communication with other people. And I think the Holocaust survivors would benefit also from. There, there's, there are extraordinary, the, the testimony from the Holocaust survivors is, I, w I went to the British War Museum um, as part of my research. And they have an exhibit, um, one of the most extraordinary exhibits, in which they have survivors talking. And one of the survivors says, I can't hate anymore. I can't hate anymore. I'm not going to allow hate to take, to take over my life. Um, but that's different from forgetting. That's different from forgetting, OK? And the survivor says that. I will educate. I will not let this moment in history be forgotten. But I, and I can't forgive, but I'm not going to let hate take over my life. Just one final word on, on PTSD. When PTSD is discovered, it's three groups that do it. It's counselors for Vietnam veterans. It's women's groups that counsel rape victims. And most importantly, most importantly, it's families and counselors and people who work with Holocaust survivors. And these three groups together identify PTSD 
which is now recognized and part of the DSM, which is the, the Bible for psychologists and psychiatrists. Um, I thank you. <laughs> oh.